Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Statewide Senior Action Council's Forum, Senior Forum, with our Congressman, John Faso. My name is Sharon Murray Cohn. I'm the Executive Director of Jewish Family Services and a board member of Statewide. And now I'm going to turn the meeting over to the person that you are waiting for. Can you tell them to turn the it's on. The turn off the cell phone. Right. Oh, thank you. I, I'm <laughs> wondering why I thought maybe you were calling me. Please turn off your cell phones. Oh. And I'll probably be the first offender. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon, thank you very much. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Do you need Do you need me to use a mic? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'll use the mic. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I uh, very much appreciate uh, all of you coming out today, and I hope we can have a good uh, forum, exchange of views, etc. Um, our district, as you may know, uh, covers a lot of territory. We go from Hoosick Falls in the Northeast in Rensselaer County, where I was yesterday afternoon for a Girl Scout ceremony, uh, to Hancock and Deposit in Broome and Delaware counties in the very southwest part of the district against Pennsylvania. So we touch Vermont and we touch Pennsylvania. On the east side of the river where I live, I mean, we, we uh, go from Hoosick Falls down to Pauling in southern Dutchess County. So it's an enormous uh, swath of territory. Second largest uh, district in New York State, geographically. There are about 725,000 people in the district. And I really am pleased to be able to come uh, speak to you today and hear your questions and hopefully give you some uh, answers. And I, I know that the purpose of our uh, the invite, they, at least they said they wanted me to discuss Social Security and Medicare, and I'm sure you want to talk about the health legislation and uh, some other things that may be going on, uh, LIHEAP, which is the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program, and some of the other things that we may be doing in Congress. We are, uh, the House is at least, on a week break where we're traveling around our district this week. Uh, the Senate is still in session down there. And um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, just a little about me. Um, I am uh, 64. Going to sign up for Medicare this year, in fact. I already sent in my, my thing online and because my wife made me do it. And I've been married 37 years. My wife is a school nurse at Ichabod Crane High School. She's about to retire from her job after 22 years as a school nurse. Uh, I went to Georgetown Law School at night. Before that, I went to Brockport State College, and I actually grew up on Long Island, or Long Island, as, they, as we used to say, right? And uh, um, my wife and I met uh, through Georgetown. She went to Georgetown, got her nursing degree. I went to Georgetown Law School, got my law degree, four years, five nights a week, when I worked on Capitol Hill as a staffer while I was going to law school. We have two kids, 32 and 27. And uh, my 32-year-old's a lawyer in Albany. He's totally off the family payroll. My 27-year-old has her master's in public health uh, from Emory last year, and she actually found a job in Washington, which is great for me because I get to take her out to dinner every now and then when I'm down there. And she's just about off the family payroll. So uh, that's uh, I know a lot of you that have kids understand what I'm talking about. So with that, let me just say um, a couple of things. I know I had some... Uh, sheets uh, that uh, we got from the the GAO, the Government Accountability Office. I think what we'll do is we'll just leave them in the back here um, uh, for people to pick up on the way out. But what it is, is uh, uh, I'm on three committees in Congress. The Budget Committee, the Transportation Committee, and the Agriculture Committee. And all of them are really important for our district. Agriculture is extremely significant because we're going to do the Farm Bill next year. And we've already had about 13 or 14 hearings about agriculture and immigration issues relating to agriculture. One reason we've got to fix the immigration system is because 
uh, not just what it's doing to people who may be living in our community who may not have the proper status, but our farmers desperately depend upon, in the Hudson Valley and the Catskills, having a source of labor, and they're very concerned. And this is something that uh, I'm working on closely. I've actually introduced legislation uh, that will deal with the so-called DACA children, who may have been brought here as children uh, by their parents. Uh, and now if you came here as a four-year-old and you're a 24-year-old uh, in the United States, you don't know anything else. You may not be legal, uh, but you're an American for all intents and purposes. And so uh, I've got legislation to try to put in place a process so that the DACA children can be legalized and their status can be taken out of the shadow. The other thing, the other thing, uh, uh, so that's agriculture, which is just an enormous, uh, uh, you know, uh, jurisdiction. One of the things that I fought for and actually got uh, last week, we got in uh, the appropriation bill that passed for the rest of the year, a provision which will allow schools to have uh, flavored milk in their school lunch programs, 1% flavored milk, which frankly, uh, not having chocolate milk in the school lunch program was something that was really a burr in the side of all our dairy farmers because they were producing this product. And think about it, a gallon of milk costs less than a gallon of bottled water. Think how crazy that is. So agriculture, we're working hard on the agriculture issue. Transportation, we're trying to get an infrastructure bill so that we can expand the funding for water projects, sewer projects, and you know the largest single source of pollution in the Hudson River today are the combined stormwater and sewage overflows when the sewage treatment and stormwater facilities can't handle it. And that is the biggest source of pollution into the Hudson today. So getting water and sewer infrastructure, expanding broadband, and of course road and bridges and transit, which is also important for us. By the way, we have to build this tunnel between New York City and Manhattan, the so-called Gateway Project, because Sandy damaged the existing tunnel that Amtrak uses and New Jersey Transit uses. If we don't get that, those, those new, two new tubes built, within 10 to 15 years, they fear the existing two tubes are going to fail. And it would totally paralyze the transportation in and out of New York City, but also into the Hudson Valley because of the Empire Line service. So it's really a critical issue, so transportation. Lastly, budget, and this gets me back to the GAO and the, and the report. Here's something we should all be concerned about. Uh, demographically, the great news is we're all living longer. Uh, in the 20th century, we saw the longest increase in life expectancy ever in recorded history, ever. We went from about 45 years of age in 1900 as a life expectancy to 77 years of age. And of course, women, because they live more virtuous lives, live a little longer. And, uh, but women are slightly long, longer lived than men, and but 77 years old. Think of it, from 45 to 77 in a century. Longest increase in life expectancy, and that's because of all the medical advances, our, our sanitary uh, water and sewer advances and the extraordinary uh, benefits that we've had from vaccination, from uh, clean food and clean water, all that other stuff, that's why we're living longer. Here's the problem. I'm from a family where my father was your typical Italian family, lived in Corona and Manhattan in the city. They had nine kids. My mother, typical Irish family, seven kids, they lived on uh, between Hell's Kitchen at one point and the Upper East Side, I can't remember what they used to call it then, but they didn't call it the Upper East Side when she lived there. They had seven kids. My family, my parents had five. My wife and I have two. Yorkville? Yorkville. That's one of them, right. So, that's the East Side neighborhood just north of where City Hall is. So, we have two. This is the demographic problem of our country right now as we're looking at how do we fix the financing of Social Security? The biggest thing, and a lot of you, some of you may be old enough to get Social Security, I'm not sure or not. <laughs> but the biggest issue that we have with Social Security, if you look at your statement, they send out an annual form, and it says, in 2034, which is just 17 years from now, Social Security can only pay 77% of the promised benefits. 
So that would mean if we do nothing to repair the finances, that the person who's getting a thousand dollar check a month now is going to get seven hundred and seventy dollars. So we've got to fix this. So I have been working on a on a proposal to do what Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill and Daniel Patrick Moynihan did in the early 80s. They came together and they created a bipartisan group to deal with how do we fix the financing of Social Security. The, the fixes are pretty obvious. Either you change benefits or you raise revenue or you jigger the formulas around a little bit, but the, 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 the fixes aren't rocket science. Getting the political consensus to get there is another question. And what Tip O'Neill and Daniel Patrick Moynihan did, someone that I was privileged to work with uh, for a couple of years, a uh, very smart guy, with Ronald Reagan, what they did is they set up a bipartisan commission to come to a conclusion as to how we could fix Social Security. And what they did in 1983 is what's lasting us to 2034, 2035. That's what they did. They basically extended the program financing for 50 years. And so now it's going to be up to us to try to figure out how do we do that again. We shouldn't wait till we get to a crisis in order to fix it, in my view. We should try to do this in a way that we, we do what Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan did. Create a bipartisan commission, come up with a consensus where you have the most you know, expert on both sides of the aisle and you get the think tanks and people who really understand the financing of the, of the system with the trustees and you come up with a plan that Congress can then take it out of politics and vote on. Because saving the system for, and you know, it's not people today who are the concern, the concern of the people who are under 50. If you're over 50, and most of the people in this room are, if you're over 50, the system is pretty much going to deal with you with what they promised. But if you're under 50, that's where the trouble is. So we've got to do something to deal with the situation for those folks. Um, it's a big, big issue. And I, I want you to take a look at the GAO, uh, the Government Accountability Office study. It's a two-pager, and it's something you can take home and take a look at and share with your friends and family. But I think it does illustrate, and GAO is a very apolitical, the guy who runs the GAO now is appointed by President Obama. We had him in the Budget Committee last week. We did a hearing on improper payments that the federal government may make. He estimates it's about $140 billion a year of improper payments, uh, where it might be fraud or it might just be errors in terms of there wasn't enough documentation for a particular claim. Uh, but out of a $4 trillion budget, you know, it's not an enormous amount, but $150 billion is real money. And so. Uh, that's something that we're dealing with, and that's something that I want to leave with you as well. So I think we have enough copies, for most of you at least, we brought about 50 some odd copies, so maybe a few more people here, but you can share it. So uh, that's it. Uh, last week we had the health bill. Health bill is extremely controversial. I voted yes, and I know a lot of folks don't want, well, now, come on. A lot of folks may not like it, but here's, here's, the, here's what I think is, is critical about this. The ACA did a lot of good things. Among the good things it did, it, it preserved pre-existing conditions for people. We've had that in New York State for a long time. I voted for it in the legislature years ago when I was in the legislature. It's called guaranteed issue. That's the term the insurers use. Guaranteed issue means they must sell you a policy. Uh, and they can't change the, they can't, uh, community rating means they can't alter the price in terms of what they're going to charge you. Um, the biggest problem as I see it, and so the ACA was good on pre-existing conditions, it was good on letting kids up to 26 stay on their parents' health plan. It was good on something else, which doesn't get a lot of uh, comment now, which is we, were sh we are gradually shifting in the country from fee-for-service medicine to value-based medicine. And what that means is that instead of the, the, the medical provider or the hospital or the, the doctor uh, being able to charge you uh, fee for service and racking up the number of fees that they may charge, value-based medicine is saying, we're going to say, okay, you're going to get a certain fixed amount for this person. And if you're a hospital, your Medicare reimbursements are going to be 
higher if you show that you're keeping your patients out of readmissions. And that's really an important thing because if you, because you've improved your, uh, your uh, infection rate in your hospital, and that's a big cause of problems when, when people go into the hospital, they go into a medical setting, and they get a, an infection which causes them to have a readmission or causes their stay to be longer. So we're trying to incentivize, and the ACA pushed this along, incentivize the move from fee-for-service medicine to value-based medicine. Here's one of the, the problems, though, with the ACA, is that it, it, it provided coverage for 20 million people, 12 million in Medicaid, 8 million through the exchanges. But there were another 20 million people, six and a half million paid the fine rather than buying the, the, the uh, coverage, and 12 plus million people received specific exemptions from paying the fine. So there were a lot of people that could, either couldn't afford it or couldn't pay for it. And for as many people as I had come to me say, oh, I really did well with this, this is for the first time I've gotten coverage and it was really good, I've had other people say to me, I had coverage I liked, we couldn't keep the coverage I liked, and my, I had a guy come up to me uh, a couple of weeks ago in our DC office. He runs a lumber company in Rensselaer County, and he said the family plan for his company used to be about 10,000, it's now 18,000. His deductibles used to be 3,000 for him and his family and his employees, and now they are just shy of 13,000. So he's got insurance, but he said, my insurance is not affordable. So the question is, how do we fix this? And uh, I'm, I'll be the first one to tell you that there's, I've yet to see the perfect bill as it relates to health care in uh, Washington or Albany. But one of the big things that was done on the insurance side, and if you think about this on two things, one is the Medicaid side, and the other is the insurance side. On the insurance side, we are having advanced refundable tax credits for people that don't have employer-provided health insurance. People who have employer-provided health insurance, that's about 165 million people in the country. 165 million. That is not a taxable event to that employee. You don't see that on your W-2, that you have to pay taxes on what your employer provides you in insurance. However, if you're the person, say you're a husband and wife with a couple of kids, and you're making 40 or to $60,000, say, and you don't work for employers that provide you health insurance. You know what the tax system gives you? Zero. You, in fact, you have to have medical expenses of more than 10% of 10 adjusted gross income in order to even get a deduction. But if you're making $50,000, you know what? A deduction is not going to help you. you. So it's completely unaffordable. The tax credits that we're talking about are advanced. You get it up front. You take it to the insurer. You can buy insurance and it's refundable. You don't have to owe taxes in order to get it. It's not like a deduction, it is a credit. So that is something that is in the legislation. Now, it's going to be, this is going to be refined, I know, going over to the Senate, and there may be some issues that, uh, that get fixed that I want to see fixed, but maybe they won't. I don't know. It would be speculative at this time. But it was clear to me that we just couldn't sit there and let the existing system unravel. There are a lot of places in the country where it's completely unraveling. Just last week, we heard in, in Iowa, 96 out of 97 counties now don't have any insurer whatsoever. So this, these, this kind of thing is going on all around the country, and the premium deductible costs are, are really making it more difficult for a lot of people and small businesses. But with that, I'm gonna stop, because I know you have a lot of questions. Gail, are you gonna? I have a lot of questions. Okay. <laughs> Can I borrow your microphone? Certainly. There we go. Hi, everybody, and welcome. I'm Gail Myers. I'm the Deputy Director of Statewide Senior Action Council. I've probably talked with a lot of you in the last couple of days. Um, there are... And I've 90, known you a long time. This is true. <laughs> and I've known you a long time. Yeah. There are 95 people that registered for the event, and we probably have 190 questions. So <laughs> we're trying to sort through some of them. We're still working on that process. We certainly will give you the opportunity to have those questions answered sort of by category. But um, I'm going to take the liberty and the privilege, and I hope you don't mind, but we have a couple of questions for you related to um, seniors and quality of care. 
Um, and since we, you ended your discussion talking about the improvements that are needed to the Affordable Care Act, yeah. let me start on that before we um, get off that topic. So um, I'd like you to address the impact on the Medicare Trust Fund, the solvency as a Medicare Trust Fund, it appears was rolled back. Um, it was improved under the Affordable Care Act and it appears to have been rolled back in large part because of tax cuts that had supported that solvency that had been um, removed in the bill that you just passed. And the other part where we see an effect on Medicare is the older um, resident who is not yet eligible for Medicare. And their premiums, it would appear, will be much higher than they have been. Okay, I can address so that. we'd like to know how that um, can be helped because when they don't get health insurance coverage and don't have access to care, they come to Medicare sicker right. and impact the system. Right. Good questions. Uh, the second question re relates to a concept called age banding, which is in the ACA today. Age banding in the ACA says that someone 60 can be charged three times what an individual who's 20 is charged. That's in the ACA today. The legislation said you could go up to five times what a 20-year-old is charged. The reason for that is the actuaries, the people that actually assess the risk in health coverage, say that a five to one age banding is actually actually closer to what the actual costs are. So just like if you can conceptualize this in a car insurance situation, a 20 year old male pays a lot more than a 40 year old male in, in car insurance. Why? Because there's a much higher propensity for accident and a higher risk. Those of us who are around the 60 year old age bracket have higher costs than the young indestructibles who are in the 20s. One of the problems with, the, with ACA is that not enough younger, healthier people bought insurance and got into the pool because they were priced out. Now, the irony, Gail, as you know, in New York State, age banding, we have pure community rating in New York State. It's one to one. One to one is the age banding under New York State law. And uh, so what was done in the uh, legislation that was adopted last week, there was $80 billion set aside for people in the 50 to 64 age bracket to reduce the premiums experience that they would potentially face if a state went to age banding of five to one. So. I think the $80 billion over 10 years is sufficient to cover that, no. but the... No, it's not. 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 No, it's that person has to be in the individual market, number one. It's not someone that has uh, coverage through their employer. It's not someone who is uh, employed by a state or local government. It's not someone who's in the TRICARE system. It's not someone on Medicaid. It's a limited universe of people who are in that individual market. That 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 is many people in this room. That, that is the that that show It's millions of people. It's millions of people. It's millions of people. It's millions of people. How so, many people fall into that category? In this Seven room? million. Seven million. In the individual market. Yes. Okay. So part of what was done, besides the the eighty billion over ten years. Um, was an additional hundred billion dollars that would go for what are called state incentive grants to pay for what's called invisible risk pooling. And basically what this means, and the federal government would fund over the next two and a half years at fifteen billion dollars, it would fund an invisible risk pooling system whereby the insurer is able to price the premium for everyone the same, knowing that the cost over a certain amount, whether it's 25000 or 50000 that number hasn't been set. But over a certain amount, those costs would be absorbed by this stop-loss, inv invisible risk sharing. 
So both those things would serve to reduce the premium exposure and lower premiums and deductibles for all insureds. Mm -hmm. And so we can debate whether or not the number is exactly the right number, and that's something that we would be able to fine tune and tinker with as we go forward. But I mean, that's, that is, that's the approach that's being taken. Now the first question Gail asked about Medicare, the tax that was in the ACA on Medicare, it's a 1%, uh, one tenth of a percent additional tax was continued in this legislation through 2020, I mean 2022. So I anticipate, I very much question as to whether that portion of the tax will go away and therefore I don't think it's gonna have an adverse effect on the Medicare trust fund, which as you mentioned is in some distress as well and that's covered in that GAO document that I brought with me. <coughs> You'll pay attention to that because some yeah. of the analysis that many of us have seen shows that the solvency is negatively impacted and yeah. we all didn't have a lot of time to read the bill, so it <laughs> is kind of hard. <laughs> <laughs> we all didn't have a lot of time, right? Every day we're still reading the of it. But right now the situation is you've got a bill passed by the House and yeah. when the conference committees meet between the two houses, we hope that you'll take back Yes. With you, what you've heard today because, and what you've seen with the Because that's the exact today. question that was raised uh, by the gentleman in the hat over here as to whether whether the amount was was sufficient was the exact question that I raised as well. So I hear what you're saying, and it's something that I'm going to be tracking. Well, yeah, but you voted for the bill. <laughs> Without a CBO score. So now we, I have another question, again, I'd like Go to ahead. ask, because it's about Medicaid. Yeah. And, um, there are various numbers about the impact that the bill that was passed might have on New York State. Yep. And we've heard reports of up to $7 billion in any given year impacting the state's budget. I have seen you say, well, the state needs to get its taxes in order, and I've seen you say that we also have tough decisions to make at the federal level and the state level, and, and if this is a priority, the state should handle it. But what we are already concerned about is that there will be layoffs at hospitals, there will be closings in home care um, uh, situations where we currently can't recruit enough home care workers. Mm -hmm. It would seem that Medicaid, which has been the backbone of long-term care for seniors, um, needs to be shored up, not necessarily, well, how do we find seven billion? So I hope you can follow that. Yes. Yeah. Um, first, the number comes from Governor Cuomo, and I can tell you, his numbers are fake. His numbers aren't correct. <laughs> well, I've, I've, actually, I've actually spent a fair amount of time going through this, this topic. And the <clears throat> New York State will receive more money each year under the per capita grant than it does today. It is not going to receive as much as they had anticipated, however. So this is kind of akin to someone saying, I want a uh, $10,000 raise from my employer, and because he only gave me 7,000, I have a cut of 3,000 rather than a raise of 7,000. That's kind of the argument that's going on. And so here, there are a couple of points, there, there are a couple of points that I would want to that I would want to raise in terms of this discussion. Um, first, I authored a provision in the legislation which would finally end after 50 years Nelson Rockefeller's worst mistake as governor, in which he imposed, and the legislature did as well, uh, part of the state's Medicaid share costs on the county property tax. Now in Ulster County, that's $40 million a year. That is the equivalent of about 50% of the entire tax levy that Ulster County issues. In our congressional district, it's the equivalent of about $224 million a year for the 11 counties that I represent. $224 million that comes from property taxpayers, which in virtually every other state is entirely borne by the state government. Now, why is this important? This is important because just as a matter of representation, the level of government that decides on the program, decides who's eligible, decides what level of eligibility exists, <coughs> should be the same level of government that has to go to its citizens and raise the money to pay for that program. But that's not what New York State has done through Democrat and Republican governors and legislatures for years. 
And this is something, what are the two things that people say to me the most in this district, over 11 counties? And I probably, I venture to guess that I'm probably the one person in this room that's spoken to more people in this whole congressional district in the last year and a half than anyone else since I've been camp I was campaigning. And I can tell you, the two things people say to me is that their kids and grandchildren have to leave because there aren't any jobs, and are we're being taxed out of our homes. Those are the two things that they say everywhere in this district. So, my provision says... We're really here to talk about the Affordable Care Act. This is actually a question that your host organization asked to have answered. Yes. We're going to open up the floor in a moment, okay. but please finish. So, so here, here's, here's what um, the bottom line is, is that I, my amendment in this bill gives the state until through 2020 to come up with the dollars to pay for it. it. It can do that by a variety of means. It can reform its own program, and New York State's program spends today $63 billion a year. $63 billion. And every, every analyst, independent analyst, has said that there is, there is talk about uh, fraud and waste in New York State's program, it's an enormous amount. Just two weeks ago, a Medicaid drug ring in Brooklyn was, was uh, accused of stealing $25 million over two and a half years and peddling oxycodone and other opioid prescriptions paid through through the Medicaid program. So there's enormous waste in New York's program. And I could, I could three in an afternoon, go through the state government budget and come up with savings that would be the equivalent, even if they didn't do anything to the $2.2 billion that the counties are now bearing. Or annually. This is a vitally important thing to changing the governing paradigm in our state. Just because Rockefeller did it 50 years ago and, and we have perpetuated that mistake doesn't mean we should continue it. Thank you. Um, we're going to open up for the questions that have been handed in on cards and Sharon Mary Cohen is going to help us. Of course, we've grouped. I'm sorry. We've grouped it what we can. Please hand in your cards now. We will keep going. Um, I do, at the, uh, before you leave, I do want to ask one more question yeah. about the President's proposed budget and its impact on seniors, so hold that thought for now. Okay. And, um, and I'll answer shorter so we can get through all the questions. That's, that's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I just want to also remind you that New York Statewide Senior Action Council is a strong supporter of universal health care. Yes. that legislation, the same property tax relief on Medicaid real property tax that you are proposing in the federal bill, but we think we've done it in a better way, so we hope you'll take a look at that. I want to thank everyone for submitting questions. Obviously, we're not going to get to them all. What we tried to do was categorize them. and as much as possible while trying to read cards and listen to Congressman Faso make sure that we weren't pulling questions that he had already answered. Um, what I'm going to do is call your name. If you stand up, I'll bring you your card and the microphone, and you can ask your question. Kathy Gordon. <laughs> yeah, you were. <coughs> Congressman, thank you for being here. I'm sorry you don't. I'm sorry you don't have more open forums for your constituents. But. I'm from Socrates. The Atlantic Magazine estimates that the tax cuts for the wealthy in the bill you just passed would, over the next decade, quote, transfer 275 billion dollars from public health spending to the richest one or two percent. Warren Buffett said it is a huge tax cut for guys like me. He wasn't speaking for me. How can you justify cutting taxes for the already wealthy and cutting health care for millions? Right. Thank <laughs> you. 
the tax reduction, the elimination of a tax that's in the bill is a tax on capital gains. Uh, that's one of the taxes. Uh, and, and there are also a multitude of other taxes that are also eliminated. So I know we're not going to agree on the elimination of the tax on capital gains. However, let me say this. There are many other taxes in that bill that have also been eliminated, including a tax on health insurers, which gets passed right through to people who pay premiums. How do you justify That's, the capital gains tax reduction? Well, How do you justify this ladies, That was your question. Well, I will answer that question. I justify the capital gain tax reduction because it is impairing economic growth in our country. No. So, so like I said, we're not going to we, we aren't going to agree. We, we aren't going to agree on that. The okay. more money we but, give to the rich, the richer we become. <laughs> We're not, we're not going to agree on that aspect of it, but I, I don't know if you agree with the elimination of the tax on medical devices. Do you agree with that one? I, I felt strongly we should eliminate the tax on medical devices because it impairs the medical device industry that has resulted in layoffs in that industry. And we have a very thriving medical device industry in our country. I uh, think called HIP well, supplied me by that medical care industry. Okay. So, but many people have many people have good hips and good stents and good other things. And even Elizabeth Warren supports eliminating the medical device tax. So you could say you could say that I'm aligned with Elizabeth Warren on that. One. And the, the tax is the largest piece. Yes, or or allowing the health insurance companies or allowing the health insurance companies to. Um, deduct as expenses salaries in their millions. Yes, that's right. It, I, I don't necessarily agree with that portion of the bill. Uh, but neither do I. You voted for it. You voted for it. It's, that's the problem. Well, uh, sir, uh, you know, I, I won't say that you come up with your statements off the top of your hat, but I will say that the, the fact is, the fact, the fact, it's a very nice hat. The fact is, is that. The bill has many provisions in it that I agree with, and it has a few provisions in it that I don't agree with. And that one that she raised is one I don't agree with. But you still didn't justify taking mo giving money to already wealthy people and cutting people's health care. You know, uh, ma'am, with all due respect, we're not giving them uh, something that was someone else's. It was their money to begin with. The question is... You know, it's, it, you know, the capital gains, the capital gains tax in the United States is, is now, it's, a, it's, it's at, we're almost back to historic levels on the capital gains tax. And, and that affects, that affects business investment, it affects, No, it doesn't. No, it does It does not. Okay. It's never happened. They invest in the profitable invest. They don't invest in the tax. What's the next question? If that comes no young people about paying fines because they didn't have health insurance or, or because they didn't want it. Okay, it's my turn. <laughs> my name is Francesco Ortolano. The senior population lives on fixed incomes and relies on social programs. How are we expected to pay the increase in insurance costs? Thank you. Are you talking about people over 65 or people, you said senior population? Yes. Okay. Well, I mean, I think we have to protect Social Security and make sure that that is a viable, thriving program going forward. Yes. And we also need, there are specific things that I have uh, been a leader on in terms of trying to make sure we have funding for, like the low-income home energy assistance program, or like the community service block grant, uh, where they help people with... Uh, 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 insulating their homes and making homes more energy efficient if someone is still owning their home. What about the SNAP program? SNAP program is another one. I, I'm on the Agriculture Committee and I'm a very strong supporter of SNAP. Uh, I, do think, I do think that uh, the Community Services Block Grant, which funds domestic violence and homeless programs and low-income weatherization and the low-income heating assistance. I testified in front of the Appropriations Committee 
uh, earlier this year about the low income energy assistance program because you know those of us that live in the northeast if you heat your house with uh, fuel oil or propane you it wasn't so bad the last two years but remember that winter we had three years ago if heat home heating oil was four dollars a gallon and that really is affecting people, especially if they live in a rural area where they don't have a natural gas connection. If you live in the city of Kingston, you likely have natural gas, and that's a lot less expensive. But home heating oil and propane was $4 a gallon two years ago. So low-income energy assistance, the Community Development Block Grant Program, uh, I, on the Budget Committee, I'm a voice in favor of those kind of programs, because I realize that's an essential part of the safety net for people that, that don't have enough on their own. So I don't have to ask my final question, I'll just do a follow-up to Francesca's. The um, industry for supporting aging across the country has determined that at least 12% of an increase is needed in the Older Americans Act funding programs. Mm -hmm. um, that We haven't heard anything about that yet because it's within the context of budget. Yet the President's budget appears to suggest that 18% cuts would be across Health and Human Services where the Older Americans Act is. Can we have you carry back that voice to say we need to have funding sufficient to meet the needs of every New Yorker who's in need of those services. Yes, Gail, uh, I agree, and um, I've made plain my disagreement with the President's proposal on the <clears throat> domestic side. I think mm -hmm. on the military side, it was vitally important. We just did this appropriation bill, which has a 2.5% pay raise for our service members. That we have readiness issues in the military that are really significant. Uh, pilots of helicopters and planes. I had a young man who worked on my campaign last year who was in the Guard as a helicopter pilot. And he would go every three weeks for his training. And it was only one out of every two or three times that they actually had a helicopter that he could fly in. So he couldn't get the hours he needed. And that's a safety issue for people who are in the military. So training and readiness is really important. Uh, but I, uh, I voted for that omnibus appropriation bill that had a lot of the programs that we're talking about and that, that you're concerned about. I voted yes on that bill uh, last week uh, because uh, it's significant. And in the budget committee, we have very dire fiscal problems that we're facing as a country. The CBO told us uh, two and a half months ago that our national debt, which is today is 19 trillion, will be 29 trillion in just 10 years. So, so it's really important. Right, you especially know, if you build the Super Bowl. Instead of giving a tax cut to the rich a, for in this health care bill, make them pay for this health care bill. Well, well, how do, why do you care about the Excuse CBO me, now? we have to move on. Why or do you care about the CBO now? Okay, on the same question. question. Okay, so we have no, another question. Vivian Beatrice. Excuse me? Vivian? Right here. Hi there. I was wondering how many people. Sorry, just close to your mouth. How many people in this audience, in the senior audience, have a pre-existing condition? Could you all stand up? Can you guarantee that these folks will be able to afford to pay for their health care under the bill you just voted for? And what about their family members that live in other states as well? Okay. Um, all pre-existing conditions are covered in this bill. So let me let me let me explain because the, the gentleman over here burst out and said not with the state waivers. So all pre-existing conditions are covered in this bill. In New York. In New York and elsewhere. And so here's here's the the thing that was referred to that the gentleman had mentioned, which is the state waiver program. The state waiver affects about 7% of people who are in the individual market in the country. So it does not affect anyone on Medicare, Medicaid, employer-provided health insurance, TRICARE, which is um, the military health insurance system. It affects 7% of the people who are in the individual market. And I discussed this with a gentleman who was here uh, uh, coming in. So. It would require a state governor to, often with the 
uh, agreement of their legislature, a state governor to submit a waiver request of certain provisions in the essential health benefits to the HHS. Now, they, they, the waiver request could not affect uh, gender, so you couldn't ask for a waiver to price men or women differently, and it would, doesn't affect things like maternity care, etc. But there are some <coughs> other things that potentially a governor could ask for. And this only is for the people who are in the individual market who had a lapse in coverage. In other words, they didn't have insurance. And they then signed up to try to get insurance. In that limited instance, an insurer could do health underwriting. The money, part of the money that was set aside in that $8 billion in that amendment was to cover people who were in the individual market, which again is 7% of the insureds around the country, the individual market who, whose governor requests a waiver in a limited instance and who might have a lapse in coverage, who didn't have continuous coverage, and if they had a higher cost because of the health underwriting for one year only, one year only, the federal government, that $8 billion fund, would compensate those people so they could pay without any increase in their health premium. The CBO said you need $324 billion over 10 years to cover that. So, $324 no, billion. The and you're talking to us about eight. The gentleman, your gentleman, I'm sorry, sir, your name is Ken? Ken Drake. Ken. Ken is wrong. It, it, the CBO was was not talking about this limited cohort of people in the individual market who might live in a state where the law and the governor wanted to ask for a waiver. And I can tell you this right now, it doesn't affect New York State because provisions I voted for when I was in the state legislature would preclude a governor from asking for that kind of waiver. But across the country, if a governor asks for a waiver, it's extraordinarily limited number of people potentially who are affected. But what we what we believe is that the funds that have been set aside, if someone was in a situation where they did not maintain continuous coverage, and they had a pre-existing condition, and the health insurer did health underwriting, that if there was an increase for one year only, could the health insurer do that? For that one year only the provisions in the bill would pay that person's insurance for the differential. Why put it in there? It's still cruel. Well, the lady asked me why put it in there. Actually, I argued against putting it in there. And I think, candidly, the Senate is going to take that whole waiver provision out. So in New York, we had some experience with high-risk pools and the rest of the country as well. Yep. So I'm glad to hear that you'll take that back again because um, it just becomes impossible to fund it at the point that it needs to be funded to address everyone's needs and move us more towards good universal coverage. Yeah, Gail, Gail raised a good point, the funding. And, and here's something that, that I have been uh, really focused on, trying to make sure that the funding is sufficient. And I'll just say two things. If, if it is, were determined that the funding was insufficient, then the Congress has the ability to add funding. However, here's, here's the... Here's the, the thing. Some states had a very good experience with the either invisible risk pools, risk sharing like Maine. Wisconsin had a very good program. Florida had a terrible program. Because Florida didn't appropriate enough money to pay for their high risk pool. And so here's what the problem with Florida was. And if, if, you'll, if, you will, if you will bear with me for a moment to describe this. The idea behind a high risk pool is so that if, if, if Gail and I both go to buy insurance, and I have a pre-existing condition and Gail doesn't, and we go to the same insurer, we are both charged the same amount of money. It's invisible, the concept of invisible risk pool is that if you go over a certain amount of cost, the insurer, unbeknownst to the insured, you don't, you're not even aware of it, gets their, puts their claims to the invisible risk pool to pay for it. See, here's the rub. You've got to, we've got to find a way to reduce premiums and deductibles for everybody in the country. Single and, well, that means, I don't believe single payer will do it, but 
But we could argue about that one later if we have another two hours. Why do we need insurance companies? Why do give us another two hours? Well, why do we need insurance companies? Well, the last, the last question, why do we need insurance companies? Well, let me tell you, if you're on, how many in here are on Medicare? Who processes your claims on Medicare? An insurance company that's contracted with the with the HHS, with CMS, to, to, to process their claims. And that's reason that wasn't the way the program started. But no. All right, so um, thank you. Um, we perhaps will have a energized group to talk, to have a conversation again about single payer and invite you back. Let's sure. have the next question for today. I actually have two questions. Okay. Um, Kim Boba. <clears throat> I'm concerned about the low-income Medicare recipients. They have been working hard, they've worked hard their whole life, but they're not qualifying for all the benefits of Medicaid. Um, funding is being cut for this vulnerable population um, in the proposed health plan. How will you assist them without this funding? So the low-income Medicare, people who vote low-income Medicare, uh, the, but they're already 65. They're already 65. Okay. They but they're not, they're not, they're not, the funding that is, the uh, proposed cuts are going to affect the um, Medicare Savings Program, LIS, those are the low income subsidies that help those uh, low income Medicare uh, recipients, not just SNAP, not just, um, those it are essentially pays for it helps Medicare. it helps pay for their um, their, their Medicare. So the um, but so it's a, in other words, it's helping them pay for a supplemental. Relief. No, it's, it's a premium, premium, premium relief. relief. So, so there are several provisions for low income subsidies and Medicare savings program. Um, the uh, lower income people who are above Medicaid mm -hmm. can get assistance with their Part B premium or their drug premium. And in the first iteration of the bill, I saw that it was maintained, which I was very pleased about. I haven't had an opportunity to see whether that continued in the last yep. several amendments, but people need help. The premiums for Medicare and the out-of-pocket costs are pretty high for people who are living so, close to the edge. So my belief, Gail, is that that was not changed from the first iteration. It was but, changed. It but, was but I will have, I will have to go back and look at that particular provision. Are we also talking about dual eligibles? Well, do no, that's another category. Have, have a different fund. Okay. Okay. These are people that have worked hard their whole life. They, they didn't make a lot of money. They, are, uh, they receive Medicare, but um, they're struggling. These are people that do not qualify for the rich benefits available in Medicaid, but they're, they're just above that line. Um, and they are a very vulnerable population. And it's our population that we serve at the Office for Aging. Um, and without that extra help, without those, you know, uh, the Medicare Savings Program, et cetera, I don't know how they're going to survive. I mean, they're, they're, these are the people that really have to make that choice. Am I going to eat? Am I going to, you know, um, am I going to pay my oil bill? And to, and to, to, to answer that, I'll send you some stuff, but to add to that, in the, in the budget bill that we just passed, there was a cut in the SHIP, in the ship which on the stamp <coughs> the appropriation bill, the appropriation bill. there was a, a, a small cut, a big to all of us, in the people who were the counselors, many of whom are volunteers, that help people know how to get those benefits. So I'll send you some stuff on both of that, and I ask you to respond. You have the people that make between 1000 and 1400 on Social Security. Having a really difficult time, especially, <coughs> especially <coughs> making ends meet in counties <coughs> that have become a little bit more expensive because we have had an influx from further south as we become more affordable for some people. Right. Um, so the answer to that is. I'm going to follow up with Kim and Yale to uh, just make sure that we're talking about the same thing and make sure that, that I would certainly want to support that coverage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Sarah Henry. How uh, our government and how it, you is voting for this bill can justify the cut of some $800 billion from Medicaid. Okay. Which will clearly, and the, the rider on that, the tax break, again, I would propose is a difficult matter because it's $600 billion, so it's almost the amount that then is getting cut from Medicaid. Yes, right. Yeah. That's exactly right. So that's true. That, that, that is an argument. I heard, I've heard that argument. Now, um, I, want to, I want to reiterate Medicaid is going to increase year by year from the federal government to the state. It is not going to increase as fast as what some had projected. And so here's, here's the big area where the difference in funding is going to exist. Under the ACA, when we did the Medicaid expansion, when they did the Medicaid expansion back in 2010, they promised every state that every, all the single adults that they got into the expansion would be reimbursed first at 95% and then at 90%. And they said this is going to go on forever. I can tell you from the, from the fiscal standpoint of the federal government, that 90% was not going to continue because it's not sustainable. The other part of this, though, some of us got provisions in the legislation that said, a state like New York that did the expansion could continue the expansion through the end of 2019. So they could still, for the next over two and a half years, sign up additional people into the expansion. After 2020, the state would continue to be reimbursed at the higher rate until that person came off the Medicaid program. If they went back on the Medicaid program, then they would come back in at the traditional 50% rate, which is what traditionally the federal government reimburses uh, Albany for its Medicaid system. So that is the major part of the so-called cut. And I can tell you that there's my analysis of the federal budget and many others says that it was not a sustainable cost for the federal government to keep that at 90%. And if you think about it, it's not really equitable to reimburse the disabled person living in a group home at 50% and the single, often employable adult at 90%, or the senior in a nursing home at 50%, and the single employable adult at 90%. So, what, what my focus was also, however, the state is gonna receive what's called a per capita block grant if this thing goes forward. So that the money that the state gets every year from Washington is going to increase by medical inflation. But for disabled people and people in nursing homes, seniors in nursing homes, because to me, they're the most vulnerable, we achieved getting a plus one for medical inflation, plus one for disabled people and for seniors in nursing homes. And so I think that it's very important to keep in mind, there's one other program, and that's, that's called the, uh, what is the Medicaid program? I wanna say the expansion plan, the essential, essential plan. I, for some reason, Gail, thank you, I appreciate that. The Essential Plan. This is a program where the state has set up through a special waiver with HHS, funding for people that are between 138 and 200% of poverty. Now they did this with a waiver where they got the money from Washington for the so-called premium support because a lot of these people in 138 to 200 weren't eligible for the Medicaid expansion. However. The, they would have been eligible for premium support if they got on an ACA exchange. So what I'm proposing and what I will be proposing is that we can maintain much of what the, uh, the essential plan is today by taking the advanced refundable tax credits, the, the amount, say it's $3,000 for a 30-year-old who's on the essential plan, and the state received the $3,000 for that person, just like it's receiving the premium support now to fund the essential plan. And that it get a waiver, HHS and Tom Price, the new secretary, and Seema Verna, who's the new head of CMS, has said they will be very, very liberal with the granting of state waivers. <laughs> <laughs> 
What if the states do not accept it or do not participate like happens now? In, in actuality, there are only two states in the country, Minnesota and New York, that have done the essential plan. But I have a strategy by using the advanced refundable tax credits in replacement for the premium support to basically allow New York to continue the essential plan that now they charge people like 20 bucks a month for. So this is, this is something that I do think uh, the 13th, they're called 1332 waivers. They're different from those waivers that, that we were talking about previously. But these 1332 waivers are something that um, I strongly support. And I think that uh, it'll be something that New York State could actually fashion a program using the advanced refundable tax credits so it gets the tax credits all in a lump. For, you know, there are 600,000 people on the essential plan. And just say hypothetically, 500,000 of them are still there. They get an average of $3,000 a person. The state could, with that pot of money, fund much of what it now has through the essential plan. So I hear you saying that the essential plan is important, and you'll advocate with CMS to make sure that yeah. the state's waiver gets continued, yeah. or get a new waiver in order for that program to go. I, I accurately re dis described how the essential plan is paid for mm -hmm. now. So, and if there are problems, you'll be there to help us fix it. Always. Carolyn <laughs> 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 Paulson? Hi, Mr. Bazo. Hi. Uh, I am a insulin-dependent diabetic. I have been since uh, my childhood. I was exposed to PCBs in the Hudson, where I swam all the time. I was also sprayed extensively with DDT when I got caught in an agricultural field. So I've been dependent on insulin most of my life. Mm -hmm. Now, I have maintained excellent, uh, I don't, I have never had a complication because I have really had good medical care. But there is a tremendous problem with insulin, and also particularly for seniors because insulin is considered a drug, falls into the gap. Um, we have, uh, as an insulin dependent person, you also need certain drugs as well as insulin. And I'd like to know if you would um, address this problem because if we have the treatment we need, we can avoid going blind, we can avoid kidney failure, we can avoid amputations. Um, a couple of years ago when the ACA was put in, for some very strange reason that nobody could really ever explain to me, my pharmacist was suddenly not paid for the insulin that he sold to me. This was when, uh, now, it, because of bureaucratic weird things, <coughs> and uh, actually he was never paid for nine months of insulin that he sold to me. The problem turned out to be I, I had to buy it one month at a time, but nobody told me that before. Okay, so um, given the dire need that we have for insulin, I, I would like to direct your attention to making certain that this is handled in a more same manner. Are you on Medicare? I'm on Medicare, and I was on Medicare when point? my pharmacist was denied. Okay. Which did not, he, he was selling it to me three months at a time, which he had been doing for 15 years. Right. And suddenly the programs changed. Are you, um, um, are you in a Medicare, uh, traditional Medicare or Medicare Part, uh, uh, Medicare Advantage program? I, I'm, I'm in traditional Medicare. Okay. I have an insulin pump. Um, but that is really not, they, what I hear when I hear all of these programs, I hear an awful lot of various things with a lot of bureaucratic steps. It all sounds very complicated. Sounds to me like a lot of people can fall into the cracks. Mm -hmm. Oh, what we need is something simpler to administer. Single pair. We need something easier. With a lot of different programs that hopefully will work out, and we we really need single payer, and we need a profit. My my income now is three hundred fifty dollars a month uh, uh, for one vial, and in other countries it's like fifty dollars for a vial. And this is totally because my need for insulin is a big profit-making opportunity for others. Mm -hmm. So one of the 
things we didn't ask you about, and it is in the in general, is how to get a handle on pharmaceutical cost containment and how to make sure that the industry is there, but that, that people are not paying an undue amount on that. So hopefully you can, hopefully you can bring that back. Also, um, I'm sure that if anybody has issues like this, that if they called your office, your constituency help right. would try to help. Um, yeah, if, if someone has a specific issue, we deal all the time with veterans claims, immigration issues, disability issues, and payment issues with CMS uh, and Medicare. And uh, so those are, those are things that our office routinely does on behalf of constituents. So if you have an issue where you think something is wrong or you're not being treated fairly, I mean, we certainly will try to help you in that regard. But, but uh, I'm also talking about insulin it is a specific thing that yeah. If you need it, you either get it or you die. If you don't need it and you take it anyway, you die. So it's a very critical short-term thing. <coughs> no, I, I agree with you. And uh, one of the things, you've heard of the myelin uh, issue with uh, the EpiPens. Yes. Um, yeah, this was a, an example of pure greed on, on the part of uh, that company. This guy took over a company. It had a long-standing product. And one of the things that I would like to see at the very time when that issue was coming to the fore, the, uh, I read in the press of a Danish company that had the pharmacological equivalent of the epiphedrine um, that is used in the EpiPen. And it has the exact same result. It was $75 for a, a, a dual injector kit. That was a Danish company. So one of the things that I would like to see is for countries that have a advanced review process for pharma, pharma, pharma <coughs> products, um, like the UK, uh, Switzerland, Sweden, Germany, Japan, Canada. Denmark, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Canada. You know. So for countries that have an advanced safety evaluation system, so that we are confident that the products that are coming into our marketplace have, have undergone strict scrutiny before they're allowed into the marketplace. I think we should let those products from those countries come in because competition, in especially in, in uh, uh, drug areas like this that you're talking about, insulin, uh, the EpiPen, etc., and some others, there have been some terrible examples where someone takes a a product that has been on the market for dozens of years and then they buy it and they do a leveraged buyout and then they wind up jacking up the price and we're all paying through Medicare, Medicaid, the VA, etc. And that kind of thing I think has to stop. Because Medicare doesn't negotiate prices. Right. We have um, one more question and, and I just want to let you know that the Congressman has already extended his time with us, which I very much appreciate. Um, we probably have five hours worth of questions, but the next one is, the next and last one is. Christine Coates. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's so much, there's, there's so much information that comes from so many various sources. And I'm asking if you have any idea of where there is a comprehensive uh, guide to Obamacare and uh, what the people voted for Thursday. Exactly. Who will be getting, who got what, and who will be getting what. Now, I've seen, I've seen Republican uh, governors from West Virginia and other places on C-SPAN. Ohio. Um, supporting <coughs> Obama's plan, not wanting it repealed. And I've seen people from all over, you know, from different parts of the country who voted for Trump not wanting to see it repealed. So it's, you know, you hear one thing from one person, one set of things from one, one set of things, 
it's very hard for me to get a handle, and I wonder what is the best place without spending a month in the library or on the computer. <laughs> library is a good place. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but you're not in to it. Yeah. I mean, okay. is there an honest I mean, we've Christine asked a very good question. Um, I think that uh, you can actually get some pretty good information uh, from people on the left and people on the right. Uh, Kaiser. Uh, there's a research uh, thing uh, called Kaiser. I can't remember. It's not Kaiser Family Foundation, which I use. I look at the Empire Center stuff that comes out of Albany, which gives you a good state-level perspective on a lot of the things that are going on in Washington. There's also the American Enterprise Institute, which is a more conservative think tank. They have some pretty good information, and. Frankly, uh, I'm waiting for Congressional Research Service, which I think does the best uh, kind of straight, nonpartisan uh, analysis. The place that I find that those are those are sources of information I try to use. The worst source of information I find is social media and the internet, because you never really know what's really true or what's being uh, you know tilted one way or the other. But I think. Uh, Obviously, uh, it is a very difficult thing to sift through. <laughs> Healthcare is complicated, there's no doubt about it. And it is a very, very, um, uh, there are a lot of moving parts that are associated with it. But I think you raise a very good question, and I would, I would recommend those sources to you, not because that I will agree with everything or disagree with everything, but because I do think they offer a perspective that's balanced and neutral even if they if they may come at it with a, a, a more left or a more right uh, center agenda. So I think all of those things are good. Lastly, let me just say, I'll write them down for you. <laughs> Lastly, let me just say I, I thank uh, Senior Action for uh, inviting me, and I thank Gail and all of you for coming today. Um, it's very productive for me to hear your questions. Um, obviously, uh, I know I can't satisfy all the people all the time, and I don't try to, but I do try to fairly represent the interests of our district and recognizing that we have a big, broad, diverse district over these 11 counties. So I thank you for coming today, and I do think if you hang out in the library more often, you're probably better off. So thank you so much. Congressman Basso, can I just say, if you want more information on a good single-payer plan that has absolutely been assessed and up and running, Thank you, Star. The legislature in New York State is called the New York Health Star, we talked about that. Everything that you Thank you. We, we, we put it out there already. What's your take on the Thank president's tax plan? And we're going to come back. You need to stay with us. Um, we have a bit more program. We need to talk about what do we do next? How do we have your input for that? I hope you found um, this a rewarding use of your last hour and a half. <laughs> Um, if you have questions that you want to have added to that pool, go grab up index card, write down your name. Um, and because you be registered, I have your contact information to add to that. So we will continue that discussion. Um, I'd like to introduce you to, if you don't already know, Kelly McMullen, who is the head of the Office for Aging here in Ulster County, who will be um, helping us with the next portion of our program. Thank you for being here. I want to thank Congressman Basso for being here. Thank you so much. And Statewide Senior Action Council for organizing this event. I want to point out that it's because of Statewide Senior Action Council's reputation with Congressman Basso that he's here today. Um, what we have is a civil discourse, um, an organized discourse with Congress uh, and Faso, and that's how we get them in the room. So, uh, Ulster County uh, is right now forming a chapter of Statewide Senior Action Council, and I encourage all of you to individually 
uh, sign up with statewide. The fee is optional, but recommended, and hopefully you pay it, $15 a year. You can be individually and independently updated with regard to any and all issues of concern to seniors in New York State as well as federally. I will tell you that now is the time to pay attention. Now is the time to take action. Now is the time to be educated about these issues. It is not time to lie down. And senior representatives and elected officials like to say that they have seniors on their side. They like to say that they represent the interests of seniors. Now is the time to hold them accountable for that. So, as John Faso said, he has 725,000 people that he represents in 11 counties. Statewide Senior Action Council can help us be organized with regard to our voice and our concerns and issues to elected representatives. So we will be more powerful in numbers, and if our voice and our issues and our concerns are organized in terms of being communicated to our elected representatives. So we are forming a chapter in Ulster County. You were invited here because you reached out to Statewide Senior Action Council. The Advisory Council of the OFA was invited here also. Many of them have become members. I would dare say that they will all individually become members. Um, and so we will be working with statewide to hold future forums, uh, to be educated about the issues. Uh, as many of you said here in the room, these, these uh, topics are complicated and we need professionals who can help us break them down and understand them. Yes. And then can help us synthesize our voice, right, in coming back. So being organized right now I think is key. And I'm going to let Gail uh, talk to you some more, but I strongly encourage you to join the chapter. So, um, this was fun. <laughs> um, it was particularly a struggle, and, and we're sorry we couldn't have accommodated more of the community. But, as Kelly pointed out, we started out with this idea, um, here's Sarah. Well, anyhow, Sarah's someplace out there. She's been working hard. Sarah is an MSW intern that is working with Jewish Family Services. Sharon Marie Cohn, who was helping us this morning, um, is the executive director of Jewish Family Services and on, on our board of directors. And Sarah Hicks Project. There she is. Everybody say hi to Sarah. So Sarah's master's project was community organizing, and she got together with Sharon, and they said, let's organize seniors in Ulster. There clearly is a need to make sure that we have opportunities for the congressman to hear from us. Um, and sat forward with a plan that said, okay, how are we going to do that? And with Kelly's um, largesse and help from the county, we held two lunch and learns to get really drilled down on these topics. Some of you may have come to those. Um, in addition, um, we did a number of events and we'll be continuing, when am I coming to you? In June. Um, we'll be continuing to do um, discussions and lectures, or however you want to describe it, where I'll talk about what I might know today, and then we'll come up with more questions. And so, um, the, this project of developing a chapter was to give us more visibility. Because I do have a relationship with the congressman, as you can tell, but you know I didn't have the relationship with you all to be able to say, here's what people are saying, and here's what the concerns are. Um, so thank you, and uh, onward to more degrees and remembering the seniors always. Um, so the the next part of what we want to talk about is really being able to figure out what do we do next? Um, do we have your support and how do we effectively you know, embrace more people because we have to limit the number of people based on what I envisioned was going to be our meeting. Um, so I'm glad everybody who got in did, and I want you to spread the word to everyone who was not here. Did you have a question? I do. My question to right you, to uh, my question to you is, I was very impressed by how, how prepared you were. My question is, does it make any difference? Have you ever affected the vote of anybody like John Faso? In any real material way? Can I answer? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So how many of you have Epic? How many of you know about Epic? 
people. Yes. So Epic is the elderly pharmaceutical insurance coverage program for people who are 65 years of age and over. Recently, in the last several years, we were effective in expanding the income brackets for Epic so that it's single at $75,000 and a couple at $100,000 a year income would qualify. That's state. Yeah. That's state. Yes. So pass on Well, but, 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 but recently that's what we did. But the important part is that we burst the EPIC program. It did not exist before statewide heard from our members and from seniors throughout the state. Before Medicare Part D and since, that drugs were unaffordable. And we took action, as some of you heard me say this, including renting buses and driving seniors to Canada to re-import drugs at risk of being arrested, in which case we made CNN news before CNN was CNN, <laughs> um, before there were any other national news sources like that. And Assemblyman Faso, um, along with the rest of the legislature, um, not particularly at that time, has been a supporter and listened to us. In the last several years, how many of you have heard about observation status? Observation status is um, simply oh, yes, what? Yes, yes. When you go to the hospital, the hospital may decide to admit you, yeah. or they may decide to put you into a bed that looks like you've been admitted, yeah. but instead of charging it as admission under Medicare Part A, charges it as outpatient, even though you're in a bed, so okay. <laughs> Medicare Part B. We got the state legislature to require hospitals to notify someone in that bed what their status was so they could start the appeal process. And our New York State law that we wrote became federal law. Sign me up. So, <laughs> the answer is yes. And the most important part of the answer being yes, I think, is that none of that comes from some hierarchy someplace trickling down to the staff to say, do this, and then us coming out and saying, hey, look what we did. It start, we are a grassroots up membership organization. Every member, we don't have a delegate system, every member has the same voice. And what forming a chapter here does is gives us more seats on our board of directors from chapters, so you would also be able to have more representation. And I just want to add the Statewide Senior Action Council has been very good at defining the problem and recommending the solutions. So you can tell from our time with Congressman Faso today that we can get very mired down in technical bureaucratic yes. Yes. information, yes. which eats up time and is confusing and, and, and right isn't really the solution. Statewide has been very effective at stating the problem and identifying the solutions and cutting through that. And again, that's what I said, that's what we need now, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why it's statewide that we want to have form a chapter here in Ulster, because they have a track record of doing this. I just want to point out something else too. We collaborated this weekend uh, as pre the pre screening Saturday. Is Alana here? Alana Berger was here. She's the director of Hand in Hand which is the Domestic Employers Network. And you know when you think about solutions to problems, we spend a lot of time talking about health insurance. I want to talk about health care. Because in all of this conversation about health insurance, we're not talking about a very significant issue in health care. And that is home health aids, personal care assistance. The single thing that keeps people out of nursing homes where they don't want to be, and where care sometimes is not that great, but outrageously expensive is a few hours of home care, personal care aides, home health assistance. We have a problem. When we look at the numbers of seniors who will need that care in the next few years, we have only one third of the number of workers that we will need to meet the need. One third. And guess what? Two thirds of that one third of the need is being filled by immig immigrants. Yes. <laughs> and half of them are not documented. So these issues bump into one another, right? It's a salient voice that paints the picture and ties in all the issues that are related. We can't talk about health insurance without talking about health care, and we can't talk about health care without talking about immigration and our need for a workforce that currently does not exist in the numbers that will support us to live at home. So statewide is good at this. They are good at painting the picture and giving us the constellation of all the stars in the universe that connect, and then stating the problem in that way. 
So we did this screening of the of a documentary called Care. We were on a panel discussion at Upstate Films <coughs> on Ryan Beck on, in Ryan Beck on Saturday. We can put that film also in this uh, in Ulster County. We're talking about the Rosendale Theater, perhaps in Upstate and Woodstock. It's a one-hour documentary, and then we had a panel discussion. The issue of domestic workers and how they are treated and how they are paid is a serious issue that needs to be addressed. So many of them do not have health care. They do not have days off. They work 12-hour shifts but must be available for 24 hours. They are not earning a wage that supports them to earn money to support their own families. But yet they are a pool of potential workers that could meet our needs in the future. So that's just another example of, as we get into these issues, uh, uh, Gail connected me to hand in hand. So now I'm involved with the domestic workers issue and domestic employers issues. I get a lot of phone calls from people who have money who say, how do I get a home care aid in my home? And I say, good luck. <laughs> because first of all, we, I have 85 people right now waiting for personal care aids in my program for low-income Medicare uh, uh, folks who would qualify for personal care aids through the Office for the Aging. I have 85 people on the wait list. I don't have enough money. All right? Uh, we have whole areas in a big rural county that we can't get workers for because they're only paid for the hour they work or the two hours they work with a senior and not the travel time in between. Sure. Okay. Right? Uh, it's, yeah, it's $7 an hour. Oh, $10 an hour. It's minimum wage. It's not fast. And so then you see these issues about let's raise the uh, McDonald's workers to $15 an hour. What do you think that's going to do to the home health care issue? People work very, very hard and have to be skilled to serve people in their homes. But are they going to lift people and help them bathe and bathroom and toilet for $7 an hour when they can go flip burgers at McDonald's for $15 an hour? These issues are all related. So it's about reinvesting our money. It's about reinvesting in such a way that we can employ a good number of people. You know, these jobs, these manufacturing jobs that were lost to China and Mexico, they're not coming back. They're not coming back, but there's a pool of people who were the blue collar workers, who were the uneducated workers that could earn a decent living in steel and steel mills and car production, etc. Those people could be our home health aides if we paid them decently, right. and we gave them health insurance, and we gave them vacation time, and we treated them as if they were doing a job that was valuable. Training. That that could be the pool of people who could do the work. So this is about reinvestments and solving and, and coming up with solutions. I was not familiar with your organization before. You are not alone. Okay. So I have a, a basic question, uh, not knowing the extent of the organization. I mean, do you support political candidates or do you try to stay off to the side? I understand that you're knowledgeable, but my question becomes, you know, we're talking about some so basic things that you would need a shift in the culture so that people understand but if you're going to provide services for people that you have to be willing to pay for it one way or the other, and it's not by increasing your federal, you know, budgets to, for the military. So. so we are a 501c3 not-for-profit organization. We are not partisan. We do not do political endorsements. However, we do policy analysis and action so that when those politicians come around only the week before election and want to kiss the seniors and kiss the babies, the seniors are more prepared to be able to say, but what about, and if you want my vote, here's the issues I'm concerned about. We partner, I guess I shouldn't say it that way, we have many collegial organizations that we work with, some of whom do do more political um, action, um, like citizen action, yeah. And we are um, very engaged with a lot of partners, but for us, it's based on where people, other organizations, and elected officials, and those who wish to be elected, where they stand on the issues that have been determined to be important to seniors. So there's a lot that can be done without political <coughs> action, but there's a lot of ways to have, you know, this side of you do the part that you do, and this side hang out with other people who do the other thing. <laughs> I think we have been very effective over the years. 
Um, I think that you know, if we had our way, we would get big money out of politics, um, and that we would have more fair representation because people will listen to constituents individually and be able to transfer what they're saying into what they stand for. Um, so tomorrow we have our annual Grassroots Advocacy Day in Albany. And we are focusing on safe staffing in hospitals and long-term care facilities because right now what we hear from people is they ring the bell, they ring the bell, they ring the bell. No one comes. And they, no one, of course, wants to blame the poor nurse who's working as hard as he or she can. We need to make sure that that part of the healthcare system, especially if Medicaid cuts to the amount that the governor says, $7 billion that needs to be made up someplace, um, that our hospitals are funded to deliver care, um, that we have safe staffing. We will be talking about the home care crisis. We heard about this as people called us, patients called us to say, I can't find a home care aid. I don't want to go to the nursing home. I don't want to go back to the hospital. What am I supposed to do? And we found that it was happening all across the state. So we have organized, and as a result, you know, sometimes you don't always get the thing you want, but we did get the assemblies four committees, labor, health, aging, and developmental disabilities, to hold joint assembly hearings. They held two hearings, they're online, you can go watch them. Um, the Senate paid attention, we still have to move the governor. And when the governor decides that it's something that he wants to have done, like college tuition being free, it gets done. Um, that's not to say that's a bad thing, but there are priorities. And one of the things we are astutely aware of is that we need to have the senior voice louder, more um, focused on deliverables that we need, and be able to say, next year, you can't end the budget negotiations unless you address the home care worker shortage. Right? They, we, we raise the noise, and now we need to keep doing that. So we hope that um, we'll have you. Now, um, for tomorrow, if anybody wants to go see me afterwards, you're welcome to join us. But should you become members, um, you will get that information uh, you know, directly and early. And that is one of the real values of, um, sort of signing up with us. Now, Kelly said you don't have to pay, but um, we're not talking meals on wheels here. So um, you don't have to pay. If you want to be a member, it's $15 a year. There's a membership brochure in this packet. Um, if you cannot afford that membership, Oh, or choose not to, but you want to stay informed, fill out the last piece of paper, which we will put you on our email list, because that doesn't cost me much more than a few minutes of time. But it doesn't cost us, us mailings and, and having you know buses for you to come to all and things like that. Um, I also want to spend a few minutes before we leave, because we ask for you to be here with us till three, to hear more from you about issues that are a concern to yourself and your neighbors. It can continue the discussion on the Affordable Care Act and what do we do? Absolutely, it's your time. But we all want to hear so that we can figure out our next meeting. And one of the things I was thinking, just Ms. Stephen, one of the things I was thinking was that we would try to organize another meeting and invite all the people that couldn't make it because as of Friday night, I was calling as many as I could to say, sorry, we have no more room at the end, to embrace them and bring them in and to share what we've, what we've learned. Um, this has been videotaped. It will be somewhat cleaned up and edited so that the back of my head is in every picture. And it will be out on a network near you soon. Panda TV 23. Uh, in the Northern Duchess area, but you can uh, check it out on the on the, its website, pandatv23.org, and check the schedule or see that the uh, video might be posted there in its archives. So pandatv23tv.org. Oh, sorry. Panda23tv.org. And um, spread the word, let people know about it. Yeah, you just, I, I come from Sullivan County, so I'm visiting here in a very prosperous Ulster uh, compared to what's going on across the reservoir. Uh, we have the second worst health outcomes in the state, second only to the Bronx. Um, 
we have a lower rate of cancer diagnosis compared to the state as a whole, but a significantly higher rate of cancer death. Quiet down and pay some respect to the term. Thank you. Yeah. Right. So we've got a lower rate of cancer diagnosis compared to the state as a whole. We have a significantly higher rate of cancer death compared to the state as a whole. If you get cancer in Sullivan County, you better find some other place to go. Sepsis is one of the five leading causes of death in Sullivan County, right? Hmm? Sepsis infection. Sepsis, sepsis infection, one of the five leading, it is not a leading cause of death in any other county in the state. It's not labeled, um, so. hmm? it's not labeled properly. Yeah. So, so we've got a lot of, we've got an opioid epidemic, we've got a lot of rural poor, we've got We've got a significantly high population of older, uh, older um, people who uh, are really struggling in terms of health care, in terms of food, in terms of heat. So I really hope that we can, uh, if there isn't a statewide senior action chapter in Sullivan, we, get, we need one. Thank you. There can be. The group that has been our staunch affiliate is the Senior Legislative Action Council of Sullivan County. Um, I'd just like to ask you, if you are from Dutchess County, raise something. We have some people from Dutchess here, thank you. If you are from uh, Sullivan, raise something. Okay, thank you. Somebody else? And are, if you, if the rest of you who have not raised your hand yet are from someplace other than Ulster, shout it out. All right, we've got some work to do in this area, and here's why. Significant legislators are from this area. Yes. In Ulster County, you have Assemblyman Cahill. He chairs the Assembly Insurance Committee. He needs to hear what our concerns are. He's very receptive, but we need to you know, be there together. In Sullivan County, Aileen Gunther is the Assemblywoman. She is very in tune with these issues. We need to make sure that Senator Bonasek hears us as well. In this area, Senator Amador may not, that I am aware, because I haven't met with him yet, my fault, be as in tune, but we have work to do. And across the river in Dutchess, Senator Serino chairs the Aging Committee. When I walk into her office to talk about issues, she says, well, you know, who are your members? So let us build chapters, build our base, <coughs> organize, organize, action, please. One of the things that I was hoping to get to, and I heard what he said, but my problem with it is when the, oh, okay. when the, when the, when the original health care bill um, was written, one of the things that they did was they, they lowered, significantly lowered, okay, you. they significantly lowered reimbursements to hospitals because the argument being this was a giveaway to get the Republicans on the bill because they, were, they assumed a significant number of people would be coming into the system with the expanded Medicaid and there would be fewer people in emergency rooms. They are cutting all those people out, but they did not restore the uh, they did not restore the reimbursement to hospitals to the level it was before. It's going to be an enormous uh, 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 struggle for rural hospitals, smaller hospitals. They're just not going to be able to pay their bills anymore. Um, it it's, it's just one of those things that affects everybody. Everybody here, whoever needs a hospital, is not going to be able to. Uh, you think services are difficult in hospitals now. Wait uh, if they don't fix this problem. So I have a couple more questions for you. Show of hands. How many people have tried to make an appointment at the congressman's office thus far and have not been successful? Anybody else? So um, their office, um, you know, sort of is young, right? He just got elected, and they have been telling everybody to go to their website to request appointments. Um, and I would say, yeah, so I would say, you know, get in touch with me. If you've gone through the process, I, I'm not saying I'll get your appointment, but we have that ability to go back to them and say, hey, Gail here, um, do you want to schedule another forum? Because so many people haven't been able to get an appointment, and what can we do to help you? And these are the issues. Um, the other thing is, we will, as this chapter forms, hopefully with your help and support, we will be holding meetings. All right, so who needs another meeting? <laughs> what, what <laughs> not me. Um, and, I, and this is now my backyard. I've spent 
quite a bit of time in lovely Kingston. So, and lovely Ulster. Um, but uh, what we need to hear from you are what are the issues. We are not here to displace any already organized coalitions and advocacy. We're here to supplement, to provide additional skills, perhaps, to provide additional noise, to be able to say, yes, we actually hear the same thing happening in Chautauqua County. How many people even know where Chautauqua County is, right? So um, that is what we bring to the table. And if there are issues that are burning issues that are not being addressed, that's where membership gets together and says, here's what's next. So um, we probably will be scheduling a follow-up meeting to this to invite you all, as long as I have your contact information, which I was pretty clear about, as well as other people who couldn't make it to the meeting. Um, we will try to open that up much more to the public if you're part of a senior club, if you're part of any other organization of seniors or others that would like to come. You know, we want to have things as open as possible. I'm sorry for today, because of lots of circumstances in the room size, we needed to limit as much as we did. But um, give us your ideas for these forums. You know, who do you want to have a conversation with? Or what topic do you need to hear more about? Um, or how do we address, you know, what happened with um, uh, diabetic supplies in Medicare is a crying shame for the beneficiary who's like the furthest person from making the decisions when CMS says it'll be more profitable for us or more cost savings for us to, um, change the way prescriptions are given out to require suppliers to be only a couple in the country and not be able to go to your pharmacist anymore. So these are the types of things when we have feedback, you know, we can get that word. And and I'm a little tenacious, so I tend to <laughs> give the word and then try to get an answer. Um, with Congressman Faza, um, I think he heard <coughs> some things today. Um, I actually was pleased to hear a couple of times when he said, I didn't support that in the final bill, and the final bill was huge. Um, I didn't support that, and when it comes time to either negotiate with the Senate, that he still s continues to say he wants to work out some of the problems that he's heard about today, and that I'm pretty sure, that I feel like I got a commitment that if whatever goes through as a result of the Senate negotiations with the House on this repeal and replace, that when it turns bad, and when people aren't getting coverage, and when people are spending more than they previously did, you know, when I collect those stories and bring them to him and say, you said you were going to pay attention. You said it in a room full of people. Um, you heard what people were saying. The problem is clearly defined for you now when whatever this is goes into effect. What are you going to do today to fix it? So I don't see the door as closed. I see the door as um, partially open. And I think in part, um, it's Statewide Senior Action Council, you know, putting together with our relationship with him to say, you have to come here and listen. You have all of those questions. Um, we've grouped them, or the team has grouped them into categories. Um, I'll do my best to read your handwriting and figure out um, how to convey those questions to him. I don't have any commitment for you that you will get individual answers. I don't know. I didn't discuss that with them. But I will advocate for that, or at least a white paper back to us answering that. And you stay in touch with me. We'll get that posted and get it out to you. Yeah. And I just want to add that um, uh, we're reaching out to all the senior clubs and staying in place. Uh, there are 24, 25 of those across Ulster County. And we're reaching out to the leadership of all those clubs and saying, look, um, even if your club now is social and recreational, it needs to at least be, in addition, educational. And perhaps you need to think about having an advocacy role, right? So uh, the Senior Summit, the Ulster uh, County County Exec Senior Summit is May 22nd. And we'll be talking to the senior club leaders about that issue, encouraging them to join Statewide Senior Action Council, and encouraging them to have their membership join Statewide Senior Action Council, again, to try and spread this out and be speaking in one unified unified voice. So I have some of the packets from today left over. If you want to bring those to friends, um, please do. And the congressman talked about a report. 
Um, I have that here. It will be at the front table. I've kept one in my briefcase. Whenever I come up for air again, I will scan it and have it available for anybody who doesn't get one to contact our office um, and to be able to say, you know, this report. Okay? Because you only work with this. You know, I can scan it and then I will not email to all of you much as I love you. Okay. Um, I will try to post it to our web page and then make sure everybody has that link. Though, okay? Thank you all very much.